The following interview was conducted with Francis Ann Watts, also known as Annie Watts. Clon- is it Clonks? Clonks. 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 I'm sorry Clonks. if I'm mispronouncing it. No, you're that. doing that. <laughs> For the Purdue University Oral History Project. The date is November 6, 2017. The interviewer is Sammy Morris, University Archivist. Welcome, Annie. Uh, it's my understanding you prefer to go by Annie. Is that correct? Absolutely right. Wonderful. Um, well, we like to start the interviews usually by finding out a little bit of your background before you came to Purdue. So could you tell us just where you were born and um, what year, I guess, you entered the Purdue Purdue program? I was born in uh, Richmond, Indiana Richmond, in Indiana. 1947 to Stanley and Lara Watts. And uh, my dad was a Purdue graduate, first in his family. Ah. And my mom also attended uh, Purdue uh, until they were married. Is that where they met, at Purdue? They did. Oh, wow. So you knew about Purdue from an early age. (laughs) Yes, I was also a 10-year 4-H member. And so I was um, familiar with Purdue uh, through 4-H. I was an attendee at 4-H Roundup. Uh Uh, on more than one occasion and actually was on the uh, stage at the Elliott Hall of Music during the second uh, roundup opportunity because I was one of the presenters so so what were you presenting on well I was I was uh, one of the returnee 4-H'ers helping organize Uh the roundup oh wow quite a responsibility well it was um kind of intimidating to be uh-huh. on that or at least Huge it seemed stage. like a big stage at that time I bet. and then I think about graduation from Purdue and walking across the stage again so yeah that's a that's a great full circle that it you was. came there it was it was <laughs> did you um did you know before you came to Purdue for a while that you would probably attend here or what drew you to coming to Purdue? I know you said your parents both Well, came. my dad was a cooperative extension uh, educator mm-hmm. or at the time called extension agent and um there I have four siblings and when it was time for my older sister, I'm number 2 out of 5 mm-hmm. to uh start education the benefits of coming to Purdue were great because there was a financial remission because my dad oh. was, as an extension educator, employed by, partially by Purdue. I see. That makes a lot of sense. Well, and uh, so when you have five kids that you're wanting to help go through college, uh, having yes. that financial uh, reduction is a big uh, factor. Absolutely. But when I was a... Um, Junior in high school, I was involved with a program called Youth Power, and that is a program that was sponsored by the uh, agribusiness industry, everything from Farm Bureau and Stokely Van Camp and um, the Dairy Association and any number of business organizations related to agriculture, foods, and nutrition, and the message that they were hoping to instill in the young people from various high school organizations that were brought in for this conference was that food comes first and how to tell that farm-to-table story. Yeah. Well, that sounds ahead of its time, doesn't well, it? Well, and I wish they hadn't done away with it yeah. because I think we should reinstitute it because mm-hmm. it's uh, it's a great message. and. At the time, I was thinking that I want, wanted to study medicine, mm-hmm. but after I went to this conference, I really thought I wanted to get involved in the food industry, more in the promoting of food than in the nutrition end of it. I and see. so, obviously, Purdue was a great choice. <laughs> yes, it sounds like uh, it was a good connection from the start when you were coming before you even entered. So would it be, have been around 1965 when you first enrolled? I, exactly. Okay. I um, I graduated from high school in 65 okay. and started to Purdue in the fall Okay. and then finished my BS in uh, 69. And that's the year that Purdue celebrated their 100th anniversary. That was a really important year. Yeah. Yes. So... So backing up just a little bit, um, were you able to major in the food industry while you were here? It, exactly. Uh-huh. My yeah. major was uh, foods and business. This was okay. in the School of Home Economics. Uh-huh. And um, so 
from the time that I entered, I thought I wanted to work in industry, and really almost all my career has been in industry. So mm -hmm. I'm one of those that's kind of an anomaly. I started with an idea about what I wanted to major in, and hey, I stayed in it. It all worked <laughs> out perfectly. You set the right goals from yeah. the beginning. Well, you were very involved as a student. I'm not going to read off all the things I found about you, because instead I'd like for you to talk about kind of the the student groups, organizations, and such that stand out in your mind from your time at Purdue. Well, first of all would be my housing unit. I mm -hmm. lived at Shoemaker Cooperative House, and and um, I entered as a freshman and lived there uh, all four years. Oh, yeah. And I just think that the cooperative um, type of living teaches you lots of things. Absolutely. Now, and, did you get a choice in living there? or? How does that work? Like, if it's, you wanted it, to be part of a cooperative, could you well, do that? Well, you, you, you kind of go through rush and pledge mm -hmm. and so forth. Like, um, oh. in a lot of ways, I thought it was much like a sorority mm -hmm. in that it's a housing unit of women or men that, um, you know, lives together, has... Um, uh, you know, rules and uh, in a cooperative house, you have uh, work requirements. Mm -hmm. That's how you reduce your cost of living by helping to support the function of the house. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's more like a, um, a social unit, like a local sorority or okay. fraternity. Um, so I just felt very lucky. Uh, my older sister was uh, in Shoemaker uh -huh. at the time, but through my parents, I already knew about cooperative housing. Both my parents lived in co-op houses when they were at Purdue. Oh, my goodness. Wow. <laughs> Neither of which exist anymore. <laughs> do, you, do you know what they were? Marwood was the one that my dad lived in, huh. and Antigonish was the one that my mother lived in. Wow, I don't think I've ever heard of either of those. I'll have to look those up because yeah. that sounds fascinating. 1942, but... I think. Huh. I think both yearbooks, you know, around 41 and 42 that uh -huh. we've looked at that were my dad's. Um, so they both were those in there houses were in there. Yeah. Wow, that's really interesting. Well, and I, I like think that Shoemaker that. might have been one of the uh, first women's co-ops as well because right? it's named after Carolyn Shoemaker. Yes, yes, and I always pass it when I'm on my way to work and I always think, I wonder, you know, what they might have in the house about their history. Well, and that's the at least third house. Oh, is that right? That, yes. Okay. And when I was a freshman, we physically moved from, there were two houses together on Russell Street. Uh-huh. And I believe one of them was either Carolyn Shoemaker's house or oh was one that she was involved in making available as a co-op oh, house. interesting. But during my freshman year, we moved to 149 Andrew Place, which is now oh, the Grant Street parking yes. garage on the other side of the <laughs> Union. <laughs> yes, wow, small world. Well, that's really exciting that during your first year there, there was a I lived in move. two different places. Right, wow. I imagine that brought the, the sisters closer together, as you might say. Well, and uh, it increased uh, the number of women that we could have living there because That's we nice. moved into a former fraternity house and so mm -hmm. it was a bigger uh, facility. Oh, that is So we nice. had, yeah, we had more space. Did your sister, um, did it bother her at all that you were c coming into her territory? No, there? I don't think so. <laughs> That's I don't good. Think so. <laughs> well, um, I know that because you you were a award winner as this, the outstanding senior woman at Purdue that you did a lot. Um, are there any other groups that I guess you felt like really enhanced your time or gave you a lot of leadership experience or anything like that? Because I, I correct me if I'm wrong. You you were part of Mortar Board, is that yes, right? Yes, I was a Mortar Board. Gold which, Peppers, too. Gold Peppers, and do they? I'm not even sure they still. I don't I, think they I don't have think Gold they Peppers. Do. That, but that was a that was a upper class. Um, I think it was only women, but I might be wrong about that. Um, kind of school spirit yes. uh, organization, but probably the organization that I um, cherish for the experiences was the Old Master Central mm -hmm. Committee. Yeah, tell me about that. Well, um, students 
help select outstanding alumni who are brought back to campus. And I understand the program's still going on. It is. It's going strong. <laughs> and um, I think one of the um, valuable parts of that were um, the Central Committee, which I believe is only seniors, or it was when I was there, because I was involved as a a volunteer the year before. Mm -hmm. The Central Committee are instrumental in selecting the um, alumni who are invited to return, uh, help uh, structure the program, how the alumni will interact with the students and Mm -hmm. faculty that are on campus now. And I had so much involvement with um, people like uh, Beverly Stone, who was the oh. dean of, um, well, actually, yeah, I'm trying to think. She hadn't been. She was dean of women, yes. and then after I left, she became the first woman dean of students yes. for any Big Ten university. That's right. But uh, I had a lot of interaction with her oh, and um, Barbara Cook, who was the associate uh-huh. dean, and so I. I look at those opportunities for interaction with um, them as such a a wonderful opportunity. And not many students had the opportunity to be meeting regularly with those, you know, caliber of leaders. And they were they were wonderful role models for women. Yeah. And such encourager of women. Um, Do you know um, how the did did you all get presented with some ideas for for possible alumni to bring back, or did, you, did each student sort of start fresh with? You their know, own? I can't remember kind of how the process worked. Um, I think that each year, a faculty and students could recommend, and then uh, I I think like a lot of other. Um, Organizations, because I know I've come back to campus for things in the college where mm-hmm. they wanted someone who was involved in business or whatever. So you look to some of the faculty and the administrators who would have the names of outstanding I graduates see. that you might want to consider. Because I know part of what we were looking for, and this is still true today, diversity yes. in terms of gender, age, um, degree earned, um, mm-hmm. professional and career paths, you know, yes. so that you have people from arts and culture and science and engineering mm-hmm. represented because all those areas obviously are ones that students want to hear about or, or want to be exposed to. Right. Oh, yeah. It sounds like a very rewarding experience for a student because you definitely, I'm assuming, had to learn a lot about being organized and diplomatic and, you know, being very uh, aware of your time management and things like that. I, I have a couple pictures in this, um, in this album of, I think, of, well, here's I actually the Old oh, Masters sure, programs. Yeah. I thought I'd pull them out since I'm going to the Old Masters program tonight. But, That's wonderful. Um, one of my favorite sayings is the, the one that we used as the theme for the Old Masters program in 1968. Life is too short to be little. Oh, wow. And that is a quote from Benjamin Disraeli, the uh, is, uh, British Prime Minister. Huh. And... Um, I like that. I had a, I have a letter here. I think it's from Dean Stone. Something about that I was responsible for selection of the theme. I didn't remember that until I went back and looked at this letter. See how important <laughs> these these mementos are. <laughs> well, it's great that you kept a scrapbook of your time, and it looks like you were involved maybe more than one year in the old masters. How right? How many? The, well, I was on the central committee mm-hmm. in uh, 1968. And I was involved as a volunteer and um, kind of a student coordinator the year before. And I think that that's how they select the central committee is getting students involved From to help, volunteer. right, to he- help set up the visits to classrooms or to student I housing see. units and so forth. Well, that's so. that's fantastic. So. Um, I was going to ask if you remembered the first time you visited Purdue's campus, but I'm thinking because 
your parents both both graduate from Purdue. That was probably when you were pretty young. Was that would that be right? I don't know if Roundup was my first uh-huh. time to come to Purdue for a Roundup. For four H, you would have been pretty young then, right? right? Yeah. Well, I think now they 4-H Roundup is targeted even to like middle school, so mm-hmm. it's a younger crowd than when I came. Oh, that's I think, interesting. I think I was, you know, I might have been a freshman in high school. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, but I I don't remember because uh, we lived in the southern part of the state, so mm-hmm. my parents weren't involved with campus activities or anything then. That's when you've got true. five kids, yeah. you're trying <laughs> to take care of your family rather than... Uh, Are you saying you didn't just come up to Purdue on the weekends for fun? No. <laughs> no. But life was a little different uh, mm-hmm. almost 50 years ago. Most students didn't have cars and yeah. access to you know, go home very often. You went home for holidays and that kind of thing. But, um, and that's why I think your housing unit and where you lived and the organizations you were involved in were so important because, um, you know, this became home. Right. And yeah, you get that support that, you know, from your, your fellow residents and, and things like that. And I feel very lucky too, that in my major, um, my advisor was Dr. Viana Bramblett, and mm-hmm. she was in the foods and nutrition department, and she had had exposure to industry, and mm-hmm. she had many contacts in industry, and she was wonderful at connecting students who were interested in pursuing the business side of you know, food marketing um, mm-hmm. to those kinds of opportunities and people who could you know, help pave the way. That's so, fantastic. And I also believe that Purdue's really special in that even though we're a large university, mm-hmm. the outreach from your counselors and the students who are there to kind of be the mentors as freshmen are coming in really make this feel like a personal and small place. And Mm -hmm. I just hope that Purdue continues that because I sense Mm -hmm. that even now among the students that I see. And so I was, I came from a little bitty high school and I thought, oh man, you know, it's going to be a big place. But number one, I was already going into a housing unit where I knew some people Mm -hmm. and then into a, a curriculum where you know, the students were really encouraged to interact with each mm-hmm. other. And there weren't very many in my major in foods and business. Yeah, I There bet. were just a handful of us. Uh-huh. So you would become more close just from being And I same... maintained contact with uh, uh, one of those people. Oh, wow. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, are there other... Um, well, I guess I should ask you, what what kinds of things did you do in Shoemaker to be as part of the co-op? What, what kinds of service or work did you do in there? Well, I served in most of the offices. Mm-hmm. I was I was president one year, and I think I was um, like, uh, oh, we have all different kinds of offices. I, I'm sure I was social chairman. Yeah. <laughs> If not, you should have been, right? right. <laughs> Where um, Did you eat there? Did you eat your meals there? Oh, yeah. Or? we prepared, uh-huh. You prepared your own meals. You did okay. your own house cleaning. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you govern your own house. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's teaching you a lot of uh, incredible skills that yeah. are going to be important as you move out. It sounds like Into it. the world. Did you have a favorite place to study when you were studying on campus, or did you usually do that in in Shoemaker as well? I did it. I think I did most of it at Shoemaker. Mm -hmm. What about, um, so I I know we talked a little bit earlier off the record about how your senior year you were awarded the Flora Roberts Award as the Outstanding Senior Woman at Purdue, and this was in 1969. What do you remember about um, that moment, I guess, of, of finding out? I was a, a shock. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't Because as I it. was telling you, it was a surprise. My parents knew. Uh-huh. They had been sent a letter that I was to receive the award. But I'm not sure that anybody... I, I don't know who else knew. Did you ever find out if someone nominated you for it? I don't know how they selected uh-huh. it. Um, I received some wonderful letters from Dean Stone and... Um, oh, I'm trying to think who else... Um, 
Now there's Helen Schleeman too. Yeah, there's Helen Schleeman. I was involved with a um, a group that um, we created the Helen Schleeman Gold Medallion Award to oh, recognize yes. a woman uh-huh. who was involved in mentoring of students. And the first recipient was, we called her Madam Akeley. Oh, and she uh-huh. was a physics professor. And um, she had all the home economics majors in her physics class. Mm-hmm. And um, so, I, yeah, I treasure this picture because that's of Helen Schleeman, who was dean of women, obviously, before um, Beverly Stone. And then... Uh, Madame Akeley, we wow. called her. I believe she was from Austria. You know, she ha- she's very important to produce history because I think she was the first person, or definitely the first woman in physics who was allowed to teach as a professor without having a PhD because she really knew the subject well. Right. And she was and, highly respected. Right. Yeah. And, and she was an excellent teacher in mm-hmm. that she could communicate those concepts. That's the impression I've gotten as well. That's right. a wonderful photo showing the, the three of you there. She endowed um, a very large program for the libraries. And so we wonderful. have our distinguished lecture series is supported from her estate. So, yeah. I'm a, I'm I feel privileged fan. that I was here when she was teaching. Yeah. Uh, it's like the, like Beverly Stone and Barbara Cook and... Uh, Cecilia Zissis and um, uh, of course, uh, who who was who was after uh, Barbara Cook? Betty Nelson. Betty Nelson, uh-huh. of yeah. course, who's still around. And yeah, you were here at a key time for yes, women's I empowerment. Was. That's yes, for I was. Sure. Well, and it was also a time when there were there were many many changes. When yes. I started, you know, we we couldn't wear slacks to class. Mm-hmm. Uh, women had hours. Um, oh yeah, so tell me about that. How <laughs> well, how did you see things change during your your four years here on campus? Well, I think that and and it was a time of unrest, obviously. Yeah, yeah. 68, 69 and mm-hmm. and there were there were some protests at Purdue, mm-hmm. not like other campuses mm-hmm. and and I'm sure that that there were you know, there was the use of the alcohol and the drugs and that kind mm-hmm. of thing. But I don't think that if you were in that crowd, you didn't necessarily experience it. Yeah. For instance, I don't sense that that was something that I was really even aware of mm-hmm. because I was involved in things like Old Masters and Shoemaker Cooperative right. and, 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 Drinking in the housing units was not part of the culture then. Mm-hmm. Well, that's good. It's, I mean, it, it, it's interesting to me how much that whole culture has evolved. Mm-hmm. And I think that a lot of college campuses are, you know, at this point struggling with how to deal with it because it's reached a point where it causes negative impact on uh, not just the students, but, you know, the lives around them. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. And I can see how in a cooperative or a fraternity or sorority, there's a lot of pressure to drink if other people are drinking. But it sounds like when you were here, that was not the case. Well, you know, it, you weren't supposed to have alcohol mm-hmm. on on your, on your the premises, on yeah. campus. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know, maybe as it, I think, Sometimes you you look back and you say, okay, well, that was the time when students were really starting to rebel, I Uh guess, is is the best word. Um, But somehow, I guess, I felt like I was concentrating on my education and, I guess, positive things. And and I didn't Mm -hmm. grow up with alcohol in my home. I think that Mm -hmm. makes a difference, too. But um, Well, you certainly stayed busy with the academic side And that would make it more difficult to have those temptations always in your face, you know, from maybe more of a social aspect. I don't know. But um, did you take up any causes? Because this was, for the the country, I mean, a very volatile time, the late 60s, early 70s. Were there any um, things happening that you wanted to rebel against? Or was it just kind of not part of your radar at that time. I don't think it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it 
you knew some of this was going on and you were aware of you know what was happening on our own campus and yet it was like you understood some of the rationale for the messages and mm -hmm. at the time I think his first name was Bill Smoot. Smoot, he was the editor of the Expo. That does sound familiar. Okay, yes. and and he was, uh, you know, a leader of some of the rebellion and some of the bring attention to certain issues. Mm -hmm. And of course, Purdue is a, a big uh, ROTC school, so we had students who were ROTC members, and then then you have the opposite and this is I guess it's not that unusual I mean that's what was happening was mm -hmm. people were saying wait a minute that the Vietnam War is unjust and mm -hmm. why are we there and and so I think you start to question those things and and yet when you're in living these things I don't think you realize that you're kind of part of history right right it's it's like the changes in um, uh, rules for the women. I mean, mm -hmm. women had hours, but the men didn't because I think the the message was okay. If the women are in, the men are going to be in. Right. <laughs> the women are yeah. the, the men aren't going to be out if the women already have to be in their uh -huh. housing unit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what would they be doing out there? <laughs> That's funny. Um, so. I guess getting back a, a bit to the centennial year of Purdue, since you did graduate in the year of Purdue Centennial 69, do you remember in your times as a student prior to that year, was there any awareness on campus amongst the students that that big anniversary was coming? You know, I don't think so. I mean, I look back in my scrapbook at the graduation program or some of the information, and it it makes me feel like I was lucky mm -hmm. to graduate during the centennial year, but I don't recall that being uh, emphasized or mm -hmm. anything like that. And as an alumni now, of course, I think development uses that as an opportunity to, um, you know, pull in people mm -hmm. from whatever decade it might be to celebrate that history and um, as they've done I mean we have a big campaign going on yeah yeah well do you remember um, there was like an archway that was built over the street for that year I've seen photographs of it that was like a metal archway I think there at the intersection of state and grant but I may be wrong I don't um, remember that it probably was only up for that year that would be my guess and then that was also around the time they changed the seal, the Griffin seal, to the current version that we have today. I do kind of remember that, and maybe that's in the yearbooks, mm -hmm. the debris, that there, the seal mm -hmm. design changed. Yes. 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 I, I, and I, I do kind of remember a little discussion about that, but... Um, what was the thought about that? Because I have I have heard still today a lot of people talk about how much they loved the earlier Griffin. <laughs> I don't know if I have any in this scrapbook. Uh, probably not. Um, but that, I don't know. Well, see, here's my commencement. That's oh, yes. the new one. That's the, yeah. that's the, mm -hmm. Or that's the current one. Okay, so... Um, I don't know. It wasn't anything that was major mm -hmm. in terms of students, I don't think, because... Um, I suppose that mostly appeared on pretty formal type documents, the seal, right? You're and, right. And so if I would look at my diploma, I'm sure that that's what's on it, mm -hmm. not something from earlier. And like these old master's programs, I don't think they have any Purdue identification on them. No, they don't. What about, um, that was also the year of the moon landing. What do you remember about that? Did you watch it on TV? I don't think so. They brought, uh, I don't know if it was right after that, Neil Armstrong came back to campus, I think, that year. He had come back 
prior, before the moon landing, when he was already an astronaut. Um, I was just curious how aware the students were of that. I suppose so much was happening. In 69 especially, to me, seems like that real defining year of, of, of just a lot of, of civil unrest. You know, that was to me, when I think of it, of course, I didn't, I didn't live through it, but look, when I look at what was well, happening. Well, and I think 68, too. Which, 68, too, yeah, um, yeah. Because, see, I would have left in June of 69, mm-hmm. and um, I don't know, I, get, I guess the other thing is, I was really looking forward to my work experience. I had accepted a job with Stokely Van Camp in Indianapolis and so I was excited about okay the next step sure the next phase yeah. and um, I think one of the it, it wasn't a shock but it's it's like reality hits you when you realize that you're in the workforce and and most of the people around you are older, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> older and more experienced it's kind of like okay you've left this uh, kind of cocoon of youth yes. and entered into uh, a whole new arena of mixed ages and uh, experience levels. And, and So did you move to Indianapolis for the position? Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 That probably was a bit of a transition, too, just being in a big city. And Well, it, yeah, it was fine. It I... I didn't find the transition difficult at all. Um, I um, I remember my mom and dad helped me with a car payment because I was going to have to have a car, and I hadn't had one on campus. So, oh, yes. so I think my dad made the first car payment, and then it's okay, it's yours now. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good way to do it, actually. Get you started, but now you're on your own. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, what would you say? When you look back, you've you've talked about several people who I think it's it seems like they had influences on you. You know, Beverly Stone, Barbara Cook, Helen Schliemann, uh, and Annie Akeley. Are there any other people who either were your, your professors or your co-students who really stand out in your mind as really, I guess, having a profound impact on the way you think of your college years today? Well. I mentioned Dr. Viana Bramblett, oh, yes, who was right. in Foods and Nutrition, mm-hmm. and then a lot of the other um, professors from uh, which what, what was then Home Economics. Um, let's see, I, I'm trying to think. Um, well, Eva Goebel. Oh, yeah. Okay, now she served as, as she was dean when mm-hmm. I graduated. Mm-hmm. She wasn't dean for very long. She was involved with Extension for many, many years before she came, became the dean of the school. Mm-hmm. But she gave me my first marketing job. Wow. Between my junior and senior years, uh, I went up to the Calumet campus and promoted the there were several home economics related programs and classes they were trying to get going there uh-huh. and so she hired me to go up and pitch those wherever I could and wow. yeah so. so were you pitching them like to the faculty and admi- administrators later? no no or? no I was pitching them to um, uh, Kiwanis clubs and uh, oh, you know yeah. uh, civic organizations and women's groups and trying to get them to enroll in the courses. Well, t- trying to get them to be aware that they were there for mm-hmm. their children or their grandchildren or I their see. okay okay wow what was that like as a student? Well, it be- was it was it was really fun and she connected me with a woman who I. I don't know if I can't remember if she was retired or if she still taught some. I think her background was more nursing, but anyway, I lived with her mm-hmm. uh, in her home, and of course, I'm from Southern Indiana, so this was my opportunity to experience the region, the Northwest, yeah, you know, yes. the the northern part of the state, and um, How long it was did great. You, were you there? Well, I left as soon as classes were over, and I came back, you know, before. Uh, classes started. So it was a summer. So yeah, it was a summer. It was just okay. just a summer, like That's two and a half months. Wonderful experience. Though. Oh yeah. Well, and I I told uh, uh, Eva Goebel, 
uh, a few years ago. You know, you know, she just recently passed yes. at what yes. 107, wasn't it? She, I, I don't know what her age was, but she was still involved. So every so often, she would call because she really wanted to make sure certain women, other women in extension were remembered as part of Purdue's history. Exactly. Yeah. So she's a great woman. She was. She was. But I I have to personally thank her for giving me my first marketing job. She obviously saw something <laughs> in you, which is always thrilling. Yeah. Um, well, is there anything that you would like to, uh, to talk about that I haven't brought up? Is there anything about Purdue then or now that you'd like to share or... Um, well, uh, students, uh, most students went to football games. Uh huh. Freshmen had block P. Oh, Do you remember that? I, or have you heard, heard of about? I've even seen little cards oh, that yeah. I can say it yeah. on them. Yeah. yeah, well, it was a certain section uh, in the north end zone, uh-huh. and uh, you had flashcards, and we spelled out things, and oh, they were at different colors, and. Um, yeah, so that so was. So was fun. it just for one particular year? For the it was. Freshmen? I think it was freshmen. Fresh, oh, how yeah. neat is that? It's a good way to involve freshmen in the games too. <laughs> <laughs> now, did Purdue play well when you were? When yes, you were we freshmen? did. That's I'm good. I'm the era of Leroy Keys. <laughs> oh wow, yeah. that is a that and, is a good time. And and our first trip to the to the Rose Bowl. Yes, that all happened while you were here. That's right, right. Bob uh, Greasy. I bet that was very exciting. To it be was part exciting. Of that. It yeah. was exciting. Did you travel for the game? I didn't. I, I've I heard didn't. of people who did, who who kept mementos from that. I can't oh imagine, yeah. But, yeah, yeah. Well, Amy, thank you so much. I feel like you've shared a lot of good memories <laughs> and really kind of captured a particular part in Purdue history that's a really fascinating time of kind of leftovers from the fifties and precursors to the seventies. So. Thank you it so was much. it was a great time to be at Purdue, and I I feel so lucky to have had the opportunity to know people like Beverly Stone and Helen Schliemann and um, Eva Goebel, and yes. uh, to have maintained contact with them uh, after That's I amazing. left Purdue, mm-hmm. um, and they were incredible role models for women, mm-hmm. women and men, because mm-hmm. I think that. Um, I think about some of the people who were on the old Masters Central Committee, um, one uh, man in particular who uh, just felt that, you know, Beverly Stone just embodied this gracious Southern woman, but mm-hmm. who was like that steel magnolia. Yes. I mean, she really She's, had those leadership qualities uh-huh. that you wanted to emulate, whether you were a man or a woman. And she was gracious, um, mm-hmm. and she always wore pearls. <laughs> well, we had an exhibit about the early deans of women a few years ago, and and one of the women who was a successor to her still has those pearls because she donated them temporarily for the exhibit. And oh, I think that how was fun. how they were. Everybody remembers her is always wearing those pearls, very exactly. classy. So. Well, I think that's a good way to be remembered, and I really thank you for sharing your memories Oh, thank you. Thank you for asking me.